Hey folks, welcome to Build 2021. You just came from our keynote where you saw a whole lot of really awesome demos. I'm really excited today because you're gonna see another amazing demo from myself, Daniel Myers, developer relations here at Snowflake. And I'm Brad Culberson. I am a data platform architect out of the field CTO office at Snowflake. Today, we're gonna to be talking all about how to build modern data applications with the Snowflake Data Cloud. Now, when I say data cloud, what do I mean by that? It's important to understand that Snowflake is a single global unified system where you can access, analyze, ingest, and really take action on your data. You can build your applications directly with the Snowflake Data Cloud. Now, what actually powers the Snowflake Data Cloud is Snowflake's unique architecture. At the basic level, at the very basis, it is the cloud agnostic layer. What's cool about this is that not only is Snowflake running on these major cloud providers, but Snowflake is actually using the native cloud providers technologies and services when running on them. For example, right? If you're using Snowflake's external functions capability, you're actually doing that with an AWS Lambda or with a GCP cloud function, right? Now, the next two layers up is our multi-cluster compute and centralized storage layers. What's cool about these two layers is that one, the centralized storage layer is where you really, you store any and all data that you want to analyze and access. It doesn't matter if it's structured data of some kind, semi-structured, even unstructured data, you store it all there and it's independently scaled to the compute layer. And what's really interesting and really powerful about our multi-cluster compute layer is that you can actually have separate compute for different workloads. For example, right, you have one team that has a very predictable workload, but it needs to have very tight reliability and tight consistency on those query times. You can have and spin up compute dedicated to that team separate from another team. So you can have not only cost optimizations between these different workloads, but you can have this level of independent scalability across different teams, really powerful. The layer on top is our cloud services layer. This is really the part that joins it all together and weaves through all layers beneath it. It's what's responsible for things like our security and governance, all of the metadata and, and query optimizations that we do, right? Even things like the sharing and collaboration that Snowflake at its foundational core is capable of through our data marketplace and even private shares amongst organizations, and things like that. So how does this work with, in the context of building data apps? Now, data apps it's themselves are incredibly data intensive, right? And so the scaling of that can be very manual and costly at times, right? When you look as your application is growing, the consumption of resources grow with it, right? And so a lot of times in order to meet those demands, developers and organizations will have to either over provision to make sure that they can meet and keep up with that demand or they're gonna have to try to manually segment out the scaling at a very precise level. Both are difficult to do without the right tools and platform in place. Now, when you look at building these data pipelines, right? As your organization grows, as your application grows, so does the amount of data and where that data lives. So these pipelines grow more and more complex needing to get and transform more data and being able to actually manage that over time. And then furthermore is when you actually have it up and running, it's not like you can just step away from it. You're still an operational burden the, to maintain this entire system, right? You still have to be able to meet these SLAs, which is one of the things that, you know, as your customers demand and usage grows, you'll need to be able to have a process in place and tools in place to accurately and reliably meet those SLAs. So how does this coincide with a traditional architecture and some of the challenges? Well, a traditional architecture is going to have 
several different layers of your application. One is the apps and services layer. This is really the actual app that's running on your mobile phone, your desktop computer, maybe it's the web application itself, right? And the front end. The next piece of this layer is the web or app tier where the, the, many times there's a REST API. And this REST API is taking in these calls and essentially executing SQL statements to, to either create, update, or delete data inside of a database. And each of these different tiers have different scaling requirements and different amounts of demand. And so as more and more users are hitting your web and app tier, that's going to quickly and significantly hit your database tier, right? And so you're gonna have a certain level of concurrency that all of your users are trying to access the same time and the data inside your database. And so over, as this scaling happens, degraded query performance is a very common thing. And it's very costly to scale these different layers. And so a very common question and decision that organizations have to make is what is their scaling preference? As in, do they upfront spend a lot of money to over provision their database tier so that it can meet this demand? Or do they try and scale it with the actual demand that's coming in? And, you know, so Brad, what is your thoughts here? And where, what have you seen as some of the biggest challenges and some of the customers that you work with? Yeah, I think as you mentioned it, I think one of the biggest things we see with these traditional architectures are customers basically building their infrastructure for their peak load. And the difficulty of scaling out these database tiers is immense. These are technologies that were built decades ago, technologies that are very, very difficult to add compute on demand. So what happens is, you know, once a quarter or once a year, they come through and they do estimates for a year from now, and they look to see, you know, what's the next biggest set of servers they need to bring online are. And the real concern there is for you know the next 11 or 12 months, they're significantly over-provisioned and they're running way more hardware than is necessary just because of the difficulty to bring you on more and more servers. You know, these, these systems are sometimes quite difficult. These are not auto-scaling in minutes. They're auto-scaling in hours or days oftentimes. And, and that's very, very different from, from Snowflake, as we'll show later. Completely agree. And so when we take a look at this traditional architecture and, and how Snowflake is able to address some of these challenges. The cool thing about Snowflake is that we live and breathe in the cloud. So we have firsthand experience and we feel the same challenges. So when you look at scalability and concurrency, right? The fact that you're able to separate out storage and compute is a big deal with Snowflake, right? It means that you can more reliably and more granular scale the application needs as your users grow. It also means that you can isolate these workloads on a per customer or per workload basis. And not to mention the cost, right? So you pay for only what you use. You can actually scale down to zero. Like you can just completely turn off your warehouse. Then the next piece really is the streamline of, of your data pipelines, right? The fact that Snowflake has native support for semi-structured data means that you can just ingest raw JSON, for example, and you can even query that JSON raw as it is, all within SQL. So it also means that you get fresher data and you get it faster, right? And then when you look at the reduced SRE and DevOps burden, the fact that Snowflake is delivered as a service is a big win for a lot of companies and a lot of customers. It also runs cross cloud. So if you're already running with a preferred cloud provider, Snowflake fits within your existing model. It also means that you can instantly spin up sandboxes and testing environments with things like zero copy cloning that we can talk about in a little bit. So there's a lot of power in the way that Snowflake has been architected to fundamentally address these very basic, very fundamental challenges when building modern data applications. Some of the most common use cases that we see people and companies building data apps on Snowflake for one is customer 360. The idea that the more that you know about your customer, the better that you can either one, build the service for them, or it means that you can provide a recommendation engine to know exactly, hey, they're gonna more likely uh, watch this type of movie or purchase this item, right? So the, the next is really the internet of things. The idea that every single device, no matter what it is, is connected to the internet and grabbing this data. And you're using that data 
to perform you know, anomaly detection on an engine, right? If you can know when an engine is about to stop working, that's a whole lot better to be able to preemptively address those issues than wait for it to actually stop working and then address it and, and there's downtime in your, in your warehouse, for example. Next is really the machine learning and data science space. What's really cool about this is we've, we have some, some new features of Snowflake that allow you to bring compute even closer to Snowflake, where you can you know, run these inference models against you know, data within Snowflake and, and do these things. So it's, it's really, really exciting to see some of these use cases pop up and the growth of them. Next is app health and security analytics. This is the idea that your application, no matter what, what it is, there's a whole lot of metrics just gathered from, for example, user behavior on a website, right? If you know where people are clicking, what pages they're going to, you can use that information to improve advertising campaigns. You can even do, you know, uh, see if there's certain bugs that are happening within your application that are impacting user experience and even things like security, right? So you can store this information directly in Snowflake, analyze it and take action on it. The other use case that we see a lot is the idea of embedded analytics. That is where, you know, your customers want to see information about their business on your, on your application. And so being able to show them a dashboard of, of charts and give them additional insight into their business through your platform running on Snowflake is, is, is a big win for you and your customers. Now, when we actually dive a little deeper and start to look at, okay, how do I actually start building my application on Snowflake? You have a few choices, right? One, you want to make sure that if you're familiar with a certain programming language or a certain programming environment, you want to use the tools that you're already accustomed to when building your application. The good news is that Snowflake has your back there, right? So we, out of the box, support a wide variety of different languages and frameworks with our first party drivers, everything from Python, Node.js, Go, and a variety of others. We also have a SQL REST API. So at the end of the day, if you can run a REST query, you can be you can run and build an application on Snowflake. Pretty cool stuff. Now, when we take another look at a traditional architecture, I would say a, a more modern architecture for referenced when running on Snowflake, Brad, what is something that you've seen that really makes this a powerful architecture for our customers today? Yeah, I think what we're seeing is um, customers have difficulty. They have a lot of data silos inside their organization. So it's difficult for them to build products that actually cross those data silos and actually allow them to gather insights across their organization or across multiple products or across multiple microservices inside their organization. I think in this diagram, you can kind of see that, that Snowflake is the central point of coalescing all this information. Um, in this diagram, we have data coming in from like OLTP databases and NoSQL databases through ETL or ELT processes into Snowflake. Those warehouses are completely isolated from the warehouses that are pulling in data from cloud object storage, from like streaming services and event buses. And in the end, we have one now, one place where all the data is coalesced where it's, it's now normalized for additional applications to be built on top of. One I'll show later a little bit is an embedded analytics use case. And the reason I really love that is you can drive these analytical workloads and these dashboards on Snowflake, and you now have access to any of the data available to the organization to, to basically answer any question. Any insight that the organization would love to see can now be uh, you know, sent from Snowflake you know, over these clusters directly to these dashboards to the customers. The, the other thing I really love about this is this isolation. And, you know, it also gives the machine learning teams and the BI teams direct access to that repository of data. So this can act as a single copy where they go to to answer any of their questions. With the isolation of the compute, they also do not have to be concerned with, you know, will, will me training a model in the machine learning team impact a customer facing analytical dashboard? In the case of Snowflake, all of these are well isolated. And I think one extreme use case of that that, that we'd love to, to go through is the sharing use case. You know, we, we trust this, this isolation so much that we will allow you to share your data with other customers or other accounts. And we trust our isolation enough to know that that will have zero impact on the rest of your workloads. And you're not even making a copy of that data at that point. So those customers have direct access to this data as it sits inside your repository with no delays for their data set. It's real time up to date with whatever data is flowing through the systems that exist there. 
That's pretty powerful. I mean, a lot of times I've seen in the past whole teams trying to build out an API wrapper for to achieve something like that, right? I mean, with Snowflake and the the, the native ability to to data share in that in that way is huge. I think as data sets have grown, APIs have made this much more difficult. I think having an API that shares, you know, gigabytes of data was was great. We all did that years ago. As these data sets started approaching terabytes and now petabytes of data, it's very difficult to send petabytes of data across an HTTP API. Yep, exactly. Now, one of the things that I want to go over now is really some of these features that enable these capabilities. Snowflake has native support for both structured data, right? But also semi-structured data like JSON, XML, Avro, and others. So this means that you can actually store this JSON data in a hybrid table alongside with your structured data. It also means that you can use SQL to query and analyze your JSON documents in this way as well. And you can do it in a hybrid manner in the same table. Incredibly powerful. It also means that you can do the, the normal ETL, right? You can now extract, load it. So it becomes an ELT where you extract it, you load it into Snowflake, and then you do your transforms inside of Snowflake. And so it's really powerful as a way to build your data pipelines. It's all done with a variant data type in Snowflake. Zero copy cloning is another big one. What's really exciting about this feature of Snowflake is that it enables fundamental new things that would normally be incredibly difficult or incredibly costly to do. For example, is creating a dev environment that is a literal clone of your production environment, but making sure that any changes that you do to your dev environment doesn't actually impact production, right? And so, this means several things. One, it means that you're not actually duplicating the data on disk. So you're not actually incurring double the amount of storage costs, but it also means that you get faster access to new production data because you're not having to literally copy it and clone it. Because at the end of the day, zero copy clones are simply a pointer to the same data on disk. So yeah, this is definitely one of my favorite features of Snowflake. Extensibility, right? I touched on this a little bit where you can have these external functions, for example, that are running across these different cloud providers. An example use case of using an external function, for example, it would be doing translations, right? So if you have a table of data and you want to translate English sentences in this table to Spanish, for example, you can execute that statement in SQL, have it execute uh, this external function and pass this data along, uh, and it will return the Spanish translation of your data for you. What's cool about that is that it's able to leverage the processing engine of Snowflake in doing that, right? So if you're doing, in addition to the translation, some filtering and aggregated analysis, you're able to leverage the query optimizations that Snowflake has inside the same time that you're translating this data. So pretty, pretty powerful stuff. Now, one of the newest features of Snowflake today is Snowpark. Snowpark is amazing because it's a new developer experience that allows and enables developers to utilize the language's native paradigms and constructs when interacting with the data. For example, right, you can see in this example, you're able to use a functional programming paradigm that gets translated into SQL. This means that Snowpark is, is literally pushing these operations directly into Snowflake. There's no intermediary between the code that you're running and what's actually being executed on Snowflake. It's also a way to bring the compute closer to the data which has a whole slew of different improvements and optimizations when building out your applications. So definitely check this out. There's actually a whole guide and quick start on Snowpark today. So if you check out quickstarts.snowflake.com, you can literally get started and run twin Twitter sentiment analysis and be able to see across a whole lot of different tweets what the sentiment is of each one, all using Snowpark. When we look next, 
is the Snowflake Data Marketplace. One of the coolest things with this is that it is actually a marketplace of data providers. So if you are building an application that say needs and can utilize weather data, utilizing Snowflake's features for, for like zero copy cloning and native data sharing, you get instantaneous fresh access to this weather data from a, a reputable data provider on the, on the marketplace. As, and you can also sell your data on the marketplace and be a data provider. So it's, it provides new ways of accessing and getting data that you may need in your application, but it also enables new business models for selling and letting others to consume your data. Pretty cool stuff. Now, from here, I want to pass it to Brad to really talk about this three-tier application that he'll dive into and show a demo of. Thanks, Daniel. So as, as Daniel said, I'm going to go through a, an example application here. This is a three-tier web application, very similar to the diagram that Daniel showed earlier of this traditional app. This is available on quickstarts.snowflake.com. So feel free to go download it and uh, dig into the code a little bit more. So there's basically three tiers to these traditional apps. We have um, you know, basically a, tr a presentation tier that allows you to visualize some set of data. There's an application tier that is um, you know, able to provide that data to the presentation tier. And the application tier is hitting the data tier to be able to grab the data necessary for that visualization. In this example, I'm using City Bike data. So City Bike is a, a bike share program that's available in New York where you can go rent a bike and then take a trip with it. We use this data set quite a bit inside of our, our demos just because it's a very interesting data set and there's some very interesting trends that we can show in this. So as you can see, the, the real need for this was an embedded analytics use case. So this is one we frequently see customers asking us for. And it's because data sets are getting larger and larger. The, the customers that are using these large data sets want more and more insights on this information. So how can they get insights on this? Oftentimes they're looking for trends in things. The city bike case is you can imagine trips and people wanting to ride bikes changes very quite a bit based on weather, based on seasonality, based on days of the week, whether they're working and commuting or not. So in this visualization, we're trying to show that a little bit of how, you know, people start riding more and more in the fall, you know, they, they ride more midweek and they also ride better whenever the weather's nicer. So to be able to deliver this application, you know, we have those three tiers for this presentation tier. We chose to use react and I'll dig into that a little bit more later. The application tier was written in node on the express framework and the data tier of course is leveraging snowflake. Just so I get my uh, load test started, I am going to jump over and get that going right now because it does take a few minutes to get going. So let me switch to that really quickly and then we'll come back to, to this demo. Uh, what I will show you is I'll show you basically the, the warehouse configuration. So right now there's one small warehouse running and this is what I've set my min to and the maximum set to 10. So this is using the multi-cluster warehouse functionality in Snowflake. And we're going to allow Snowflake to scale this workload automatically based on the load that I'm going to put on it. So let me just get this started in the background. Let me just verify node is running and we will start the, the monthly test. Great. So we'll come back to that in a few minutes. I mentioned earlier, there's this presentation tier built in React. You know, you could use Vue or any other language you want to, to be able to, to really write this. This is just HTML. You know, there's some JavaScript involved to be able to render this. We use a charting library called chart.js to be able to visualize this. But this layer is really, it's separating the concerns really from these different parts of engineering. This developer and this engineer is able to focus entirely on the user experience. And the separation of concerns is really where these three tier web applications came from. And we see this trend in the industry where a lot of custom web apps these days are three tiers. And customers ask me, how do I build a, an app on Snowflake? And we're just showing you that your application actually looks almost identical. You're probably already building front end web apps in React today. And you can also still continue to do that while, while using Snowflake for your backend. The next tier is really this API tier. And in a three tier architecture, those front ends usually talk to an API layer. Um, I just happen to write this in Node and Express framework. And you can just see here an example of this query where the query that it's running is aggregating the number of trips um, by the month of the year. So this is a very simple aggregation. This is, SQL query is generated by this API tier. So this API tier is querying the trips table. It's querying the, the count of the trips. 
from the trips table grouped by the month. And that'll give us this, this result set here. So this is exactly what's visualized in that top graph inside of this application. To be able to do so, that SQL query is hitting a data API and it's using our Snowflake connector that Daniel talked about earlier. So this is using the Snowflake connection library that we have, that we offer through Snowflake to connect directly to Snowflake's backend. So this is all ANSI SQL compatible. So these are languages that almost all engineers are, are comfortable with writing in. So we don't have any proprietary languages like a lot of the other backend engines that, that exist today. So this really accelerates development. Developers are working in languages that they're used to. And they don't have to learn something new. To drive some of the performance that I'm gonna show you here in a minute, really we have like multiple layers of caches. So like a lot of people like talk, you know, they ask me and they're, they're saying, okay, this, this is a data warehouse, right? Like this is backed by fairly slow storage. How does this performance, how does this drive the web apps? And I think a lot of the secret and the secret sauce of, of Snowflake that's no longer secret is really these caches, right? You know, we have metadata caches that tell us exactly where that data is stored. And we have statistics about every micro prediction that we have persisted. So we know exactly what data to pull for specific queries. Oftentimes that data is already cached inside of our clusters. So after data starts becoming hot, we have that data loaded inside of our clusters for subsequent queries. So we have very fast local SSDs that we can query for those query results. A query comes in and nothing's changed about it. So if the data hasn't changed and the query's the same, we also can leverage a query result cache. So this bypasses almost all of the processing in Snowflake and jumps to basically to sending you exactly the result that you had previously. So this is a way to get massive scale on Snowflake and have great performance. The tutorial that you can get on the download from guides.snowflake.com also includes a lot of optimizations. So we do leverage materialized views inside of that demo. And also that just allows us basically to show you what a state of the art, how are customers driving the best performance for these APIs. And I'm super excited about materialized views because it's a managed service that Snowflake offers that we completely manage ourselves. So you can figure and tell Snowflake basically how do you want that materialization to look? And we run processing on every single insertion to make sure that we're maintaining that data and keeping that aggregation in place consistent with your entire data set. So in this example, I'm actually rolling up all of those counts. Every time a trip gets inserted, we're actually updating counters inside of a materialized view, completely managed by Snowflake with no infrastructure pain. You know, I talk about this low maintenance cost of Snowflake. All these services that Snowflake offers are as minimum amount of maintenance that we can imagine, right? Like we're trying to build the best SaaS platform possible around data to be able to make your job focused entirely on business value and not on operations of a database. That's what Snowflake's good at. And the multi-cluster warehouse is what I'm going to demo here in a moment. And in the background right now, we've been putting a fairly large amount of load on Snowflake. And I started with a small cluster with just one, one node in it. And as that thing ramped up and was adding more and more load, what happened was Snowflake looked at that and saw query queues developing. And it was adding more and more clusters in the background to be able to meet customer demand automatically. So we're automatically scaling this data layer. So earlier I talked a little bit about how companies often just over-provision these layers. And a lot of it's just in anticipation where if a customer comes to this dashboard, they wanna make sure it's available immediately. What Snowflake allows you to do is to really just on demand, be able to meet that load that's coming from these applications, automatically add clusters just through configuration and then meet these needs with just in time compute. So I'm gonna jump over to that last screen and we'll show you that. So in this warehouse view, I'm gonna refresh this. You can see it's spun all the way up to six active clusters. So how did I get to six, right? So I'm gonna go through query history. One other thing I really love about Snowflake is that we automatically keep all the query history of everything that's happened on a warehouse available to you. So I'll switch over to the user that was running just to make sure we don't have any other queries coming in. And you can see, this is the full history of these. So these are all the queries that are currently coming in from Node. And what you can see is this column right here is saying, which cluster is this running on? So, you know, this was the first cluster we have the second cluster that was brought online, the third cluster. If we go back, we're gonna see that this thing was running on one minutes ago, and we decided to basically bring in that second cluster. And here you can see this was where peak load was, and Snowflake had gone all the way up to four clusters to be able to meet the node of the application. Actually, we had five clusters online during the peak load, and even six as we go back deeper and deeper into this. If we go all the way back to the very, very beginning of this, what you'll see is, we were sitting with basically a bunch of ones. And what Snowflake saw was there's query queues developing. 
And how do we meet the needs of those query queues? We continue to add the clusters and we say, okay, it, we're adding a cluster, can we flush out that queue or not? And we automatically brought online the second cluster. And then as the second cluster couldn't also keep up on, with demand, we added the third cluster. And that continued until all customer load was met. And if you look at the query performance here on the right, I'd love to look at this. You can see that actually we were able to meet customer load and all of these were well under a second for all the queries that were coming in while our entire load test was coming online. And we were provisioning additional hardware, which I think is phenomenal. I, think, you know, I love the ability for developers to focus on building amazing APIs, building amazing UIs, and be able to hand off this complexity of these huge data sets and these backend systems to Snowflake to allow us to manage this hardware, allow us to auto scale these backend and the infrastructure necessary, allow us to manage materialized views in a way that allows you to, to basically offer the most business value with the least amount of engineering effort, which I'm super excited about. So now we're gonna go back to, to Daniel for, for the conclusion. Awesome, thanks, Brent. So I wanna reiterate, right? A lot of the resources that we talked about here today, whether it was regarding Snowpark, some of the different features that we talked about, even the demo that Brad himself gave just now, one, you can download these resources and more at developers.snowflake.com. And we also have an entire collection of guides and tutorials at quickstarts.snowflake.com. You'll actually see quick starts for a whole lot of the different demos that you'll see today, including the ones that you just saw at our keynote and a lot of the other ones that you'll see later today and tomorrow, even from our labs and different dev sessions What's cool about these quick starts is that they are fully end to end. They provide you all of the source code, all of the data sets that you need to actually run that demo in your own Snowflake environment. You can use it to, to learn more about Snowflake and learn more about some of the technologies and features. So with this, I wanna say thank you. It's been a pleasure to show you how data applications can be powered by Snowflake. And I, I hope to be able to talk to you soon.